babbling about Babylon 5. Welcome to Kalos's Gaming Table. I'm Kalos. On this channel, I talk about tabletop RPGs, miniature war games. Uh, I branched out into general geeky chat as I've talked about Star Wars and Star Trek, and today we're going to talk about another one of my favorite franchises, and that is Babylon 5. Babylon 5 is the brainchild of one J. Michael Straczynski, hereby who will be further referred to as JMS, and it was a science fiction television show that came out in the early to mid-90s. Uh, Babylon 5 is about a space station in neutral territory where different governments can come together and negotiate, preferably, you know, to keep wars from starting. That's a, a free port of sorts. Anyone can go there, but, you know, there are obviously rules that you have to follow. No guns, no drugs, you know, nothing illegal, although... There was always something illegal going on in the station, but something five miles long, you know, that's kind of to be expected. Five miles long and a lot of empty space that uh, it would be all but impossible to manage and maintain. Why Babylon 5? Well, the first three were destroyed during the construction phase. Babylon 4 mysteriously vanished 24 hours into its going online. And because, you know, governments do love to waste so much money on projects like that, we get Babylon 5, the, the last of the Babylon stations, as it always says in the introduction. One of the main reasons that I do like Babylon 5 is that, as opposed to it being an episodic show where you have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then typically at the end of the episode, an episode, the reset button is hit. Anyone that's been killed, you know, you forget any damage that's been done has been repaired. And, you know, whatever the crisis was of the previous episode is forgotten in the next episode. You know, think your classic Star Trek and to a lesser extent like Star Trek The Next Generation. Babylon 5, and while it did have what felt like some standalone episodes, actually told one big story. Each season being like a book you know five different books each episode being a different chapter in the book building you know to the next episode revealing more information backstory uh character development whatever you however you want to look at it and unlike star trek it was not you know this rosy peachy vision of the future i mean granted it came out in the early to mid 90s and we just come out of Desert Storm, you know, the same turmoils that we have today are, you know, still, we're still around then because, you know, some of those conflicts, you know, haven't been resolved in a few thousand years and I don't think they'll be resolved in a few hundred, let alone a few decades. But like most good science fiction, it used the setting to tell stories comparable to real life but without having to you know actually say what is fascism you know what is oppression you know war whatever the case is you know you still have you know the actors in <laughs> plastic masks but there's a lot more variation to an extent as opposed to everyone almost looking the same a lot of the Mimbari looked different, you know, the Narn had different spots. Uh, and, you know, th that was always really good. I mean, when it, excuse me, Babylon 5 first started as a telemovie called The Gathering that basically laid out the characters, laid out the story, and it had a self-contained story, but laid enough groundwork for you know, an entire show, you know, it was effectively a two hour movie pilot. Sure, there were some things that were changed. The executive officer got swapped out, so did the, the chief medical officer. Uh, the communication wristbands were changed to the little things that they put on the back of their hands. The weapons, you know, looked a bit more streamlined as they probably got a bit better budget or wanted something smaller to be able to mass manufacture. I'm sure you can find that online. But the show was, at least for me, really well written. 
had smart characters, had some interesting ideas. And, you know, like most other TV shows, sure, there are some stinker of episodes. I think I talked about <laughs> Grace 17 is missing, but, you know, your mileage may vary. You know, one episode that a lot of people give a lot of crap to, TKO, you know, is, you know, one of my and my wife's favorite episodes. You know, it's, you know, there is no unifying fandom. Everyone likes different things. And we all like it for different reasons. Much like Deep Space Nine, I really enjoy it because even though, you know, the Earth-centric characters are part of Earth Force, the future military, while they try to be good, you know, nobody is actually some lawful good paladin. Sometimes tough choices have to be made. And con there are consequences for their actions. And, you know, an event that happened in one episode, you might not have the those consequences or the ramifications of it till future episodes. And you wouldn't know it at the time, but when you watch The Gathering, so many different plot points are laid out that you, you don't realize that how much they actually released or how much they actually put down <laughs> until you get to that particular season. And there's a lot of rising action in, in the show as well. One of the smartest things that uh, JMS did, and you know, this is similar to Deep Space Nine, as opposed to putting it on a starship where you have, you know, new sets that you have to build every week for, you know, different planets or whatever, it's set on a space station, so you just build one big set of, uh, of sets, and you know you might have the occasional ship set or whatever, but not something that you have to worry about all the time. And since it's set in the same you know ship or the same station, excuse me, you know you can actually get a lot more done. The other smart thing that he did was there were no irreplaceable characters. Every character had some sort of a trap door for, you know, whatever reason. If, if heaven forbid, something happened to the actor or they just say, you know, this, this show isn't for me anymore, they had a way to be written out of the show and replaced. Uh, case in point, uh, well, spoilers ahead. Granted, this show is 25, 30 years old, maybe not that old, but somewhere in that ballpark. It's not like the, the show just concluded last week and I'm going to start, start spoiling it for everyone. But in season one, the commander of Babylon 5, Jeffrey Sinclair, played by the late Michael O'Hare, was written out at the end of season one. What we didn't know, at least not until his passing, was that Michael O'Hare had some mental issues. And literal mental issues that a lot of times prevented him from actually showing up on set and working. He went to JMS and JMS worked with him and got him some of the help that he needed and managed to get through the entire first season, at which point that, you know, he was written out. Jeffrey Sinclair became the first human ambassador allowed to go to the Mimbari homeworld. And then you brought in uh, John Sheridan, Captain John Sheridan, to take over the station. But Babylon 5 had a lot of hard-hitting episodes. You know, one of the big things, and not to bring modern politics into it, but one of the big things that led in season one and, bre and bled over into season two was how a corrupt government could come in and legitimately take the place of the existing government. President Santiago was elected, he was a good man, everyone liked him, but he was assassinated, although nobody thought it was an assassination, it was an accident, when Space Force One, I think it was Space Force One, whatever they're calling it, the, uh, <laughs> the, the president's personal ship was destroyed, and then his uh, vice president, Clark, becomes president. Clark had an illness illness in air quotes where he wasn't on Space Force One with Santiago and then he becomes the new president and in the background things start changing he starts reshuffling cabinet members he starts bringing more things under more of his direct control 
and things start to turn very fashy. He starts having the, he starts putting out the, this ministry of truth that goes out and you know effectively tells people what to think, putting spin on negative things to make whoever's doing it look worse. And anything that the government does, you know, spins it so that it's somebody else's fault or, it, it, you know, it, it's not what you think. And over the course of the show, you know, starting in the second season, when Sheridan takes over, they realize what's going on and figure out that they're being played to an extent. Sheridan had been picked because he was very much a military man, a, a good soldier, and he fought against the Mimbari during the Earth Mimbari War. And they figured he would probably, you know, keep keep everyone on their toes and make sure that nobody starts any crap at the station. Obviously, that didn't happen. But going back, you know, the point of Babylon 5 was to create a neutral ground, a place where governments and different peoples can come and trade, as well as negotiate treaties to avoid open warfare. It fails. <laughs> There's four distinctive, you know, three distinctive seasons where that fails, you know, when the uh, Membar, or not Membari, the, the Narn and Centauri War. But much like, you know, good fantasy, there are ancient evils and ancient good that have been, you know, moving around in the background. And that's where the, uh, some of the drama comes from because, you know, one of the big powerful, the most biggest and powerful race, the Vorlons, are pretty aloof. They don't want to deal with anyone. They show up for meetings. They might throw votes, but no, they don't converse. They don't schmooze. They don't mingle. And the Vorlons live, you know, live inside of an encounter suit. Well, the truth is, you know, they're beings of energy and they've been spending thousands, tens of thousands of years genetically modifying so many different creatures, creatures, uh, species, so that when they do reveal themselves in their full glory, they're going to look like angels or whatever the equivalent it is of, you know, that particular species religion absolute manipulation along the way the shadows the opposite side of that particular coin are the other ancient species and towards you know in the middle of it we find out that the shadows have been enemies of the Vorlons but they weren't like mortal enemies at first they were both left behind from the ancient races to help shepherd the younger races to give them a chance to grow. But the Vorlons valued order and complacency, well, not complacency, but order and obedience. There we go. And basically, if you don't follow the instructions of a Vorlon, well, you know, you're gonna be punished. The shadows, on the other hand, the opposite side of that coin are all about chaos and not quite anarchy, but very much the, the strong are those that are set to survive. And they, they believe that through war and conflict, the stronger species will evolve, they'll develop faster, and you know, slowly you know, move up and start taking their place amongst the stars. The problem is over the last however many thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, as these shepherds, shepherd the people, their peoples, they start taking a more direct hand, like the making people think the Vorlons are angels, as well as genetic manipulation to create telepaths, because the shadows apparently are susceptible to telepaths. And with that, the problem it becomes the people are no longer their 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 care their wards, their charges, however you want to look at it, they become pawns as each side wants to establish they're the dominant, the correct philosophy, if you will, you know, to 
take this a little bit back, you know, there were two, you know, during the Cold War, there were two competing philosophies, you know, that of capitalism, you know, the West and then communism in the East and the two never actually got to heated blows, but they used proxies, you know, whether it's Southeast Asia or, you know, the Iron Curtain, whatever the case is, proxies were used to wage these wars of ideology. <clears throat> and that is kind of what we get here, except in the extreme. And as the, the show progresses, you know, both sides start to get more uh, aggressive about that up to the point of not even just, you know, going back to being dormant for the next thousand years until it's time to reawaken and start another war. They want to wipe out all the followers of the other side. It, it you know, kind of gets pretty dark. And here we are, the, as they call us, the younger races. Oops, getting buzzed. Being the pawns, being the... Uh, the cannon fodder between these two ideologies and since you know they're you know we're mortal we, we can we grow old and we die and it's almost impossible to kill a Vorlon or a shadow and they just keep using us as you know cannon fodder sending us into the into the meat grinder and see who has the best forces who survives kind of shitty but you know it happens And along the way, ow, that's going to leave a mark. But the first season of Babylon 5 really establishes, helps establish the setting, the station, you know, being its own character, along with all the other mains. We get established that, you know, 10 years before Babylon 5 went online, is it 20 years, whatever the case is, there was a huge war between the Mimbari one of the older races, not quite as old as the Vorlons, but at that point the de facto most powerful race in the humans. A war that started by complete accident. And they nearly wiped us out to the man. In a very literal sense, they were going for complete extermination of every human being. For whatever reason, it isn't revealed until much later. On the eve of their greatest victory, they they didn't uh, kill us. They actually surrendered. While Earth was absolutely devastated, her fleets destroyed, <laughs> technically, Earth was the victor. And along the way, you know, we get to see other conflicts. You know, the, the shadows returned, but they didn't immediately start going after targets they were looking for races to actually help them pawns you know middlemen something that they can manipulate into doing stuff but not actually have to deal with possibly getting caught getting getting caught to manipulating everyone it's about to get dark i'm fixing to walk underneath a uh, an overpass not sure how uh how well i'll be seen we'll, we're about to find out going on a bit longer walk today this last week I get off of work and then it gets dark pretty quickly it's uh, Saturday afternoon so I figured I'll get out and actually go take a walk oh wow it's like a lot of the water here is missing when I was here earlier oh that's not too bad when I was here earlier this is all pretty full of the water but looks like the water is Elsewhere, but then again, we haven't had much rain recently from what I've been told. So at any rate, the shadows looking for their pawns went around to all of the races. Every one of them, including the Mimbari who actually might potentially have recognized the shadows, but they still did it just to see if it could be, if they were spotted. And effectively, we asked them a simple question. What do you want? In order to gauge, I'm assuming, how manipulatable those people were. Ultimately, they found the Centauri, 
Ambassador Molari, who wanted a return to the former glory that the Centauri Empire had. Years and years ago, the Centauri Empire had spread across, you know, much of the known galaxy. They were a powerhouse. But over time, much like the Roman Empire, you know, they became decadent. They started to lose their edge, their focus. And then, system by system, they just started to retract upon themselves and you know, live off a of past glory. During this time, they uh, invaded the Narns, who were a, a very, I won't say simple folk, but they weren't as technologically advanced as so many others. But uh, they wanted Narn because of Narns' raw resources. And so they enslaved them for you know, 20, 30 years. You know, the Narns waged a, a, a guerrilla war until the Centauri finally said, we're, we're done. This is no longer feasible. We're pulling out. The problem was, the Narn now had access to more advanced technology, and they went ahead and had a huge chip on the shoulder and a giant grudge. So they took to space using the knowing how to re knowing how to uh, get their. Uh, materials out of their planet they started building their own war machine and started to spread their own mini empire you know as one is wont to do because once they have a taste of power it's time to get some more and we'll see how loud this actually is when I get there this might get edited out and we'll go ahead and fast forward through this bit I didn't realize the traffic was going to be quite so bad, but eh, we'll see. When we first meet Ambassador Malari, he is a washed up old Republican. I'm not using that in the United States political sense. He calls himself that. A man who is still in love with the, the idea of the Republic despite the, how far it's fallen. You know, one of those people that you know, looks back on the better times. There are people like that who long to go back to their glory days in like high school when they were popular and a, a small, a big fish in a small tank. But you know, like everything else, you really can't go back. You can try to go back, but it doesn't. It rarely ends well. And then. Have. So that's where we start with him. He basically gets assigned to Babylon 5 because it's considered a joke post. Nobody else wanted it. House Malari might have been one of the older houses in the Republic, but nobody wanted <laughs> They might be the oldest, but they had lost so much of their prestige, and nobody wanted it because everyone thought, well, Babylon's 1 through 3 were destroyed, Babylon 4 vanished. You know, maybe we'll get rid of uh, Ambassador Malari. Ambassador Jakar, on the other hand, is the Narn ambassador. He is young, he is aggressive, and he wants to make the Narn presence felt. And he is an immediate antagonist to Malari. You know, Malari is an antagonist to him, however you want to look at it. But these two, for me, have the best character growth. Because Ambassador Malari. All he wants to do at this point is represent his country, his planet, his republic, and, you know, party along the way. That's really what he wants to do. He gambles a lot, he drinks a lot, he womanizes. You know, party like a rock star, party like an ambassador, I guess. Mr. Morden, a representative of the Shadows, confronts him and asks him what he wants. And Malari says that he wants, you know, to a return to the glory days of the Empire, when the Mimbari were or the Mimbari, the uh, Centauri were actually feared and respected, as opposed to the jokes that they had become. And Morden and the Shadows then realize they've got their patsy. 
at first, he helps him out with little things to help elevate Malari's position within the court and to save the Empire from embarrassment. But as the Shadows are wont to do, they want actual war, they want conflict. They draw out the Centauri, or they draw out the Narn Navy, wipe out a lot of the ships while the Centauri go ahead and launch an all-out invasion of Narn territory again, starting the second Narn uh, Centauri War. And you can see the looks in Londo's eyes. He wasn't sure, he, he's not sure about this, but he can't exactly go against his government and he sure as hell can't show any weakness about this. And the war, you know, rages on along the way. You know, this is where Clark is consolidating his power in Earth Dome, which is, you know, the you know the White House, the central government of Earth, replacing staff members with loyalists, moving generals around, getting yes men in place, so that when the time comes, he's ready. If he needs to more directly assert power and privilege, he will have all the, the people in place in order to do that with the least amount of of problems. Sorry if this is rambling and going into this, but Sheridan and the crew of the Babylon Station, Babylon 5, over the series figure out what's going on through different things and eventually set up a war council to try and combat this and fight back. Ultimately, Babylon 5 splits away from Earth and becomes an independent station, which, you know, has its own problems, but effectively they're branded as traitors, and <laughs> now there's a, a conflict between the Narn and the Centauri, although the Centauri finally do win that particular war, and everything's going to hell in the handbasket because after the Centauri, all the Shadows are doing is, you know, going to a bunch of the other races and starting to give them legs up on technology and getting them to be aggressive and start attacking the neighbors. Again, they believe conflict be breeds innovation and evolution must be served. All right, well, we're out to the lake. Looks pretty calm. Do we have any... Uh, there's nothing out there. Let's see if we can get hopefully we can get some good pictures. The first time I came out here, uh, out there somewhere, there was some eyes that were looking up at me. It's kind of like you know it was a, obviously an alligator, and it looked up at me and pretty much said, "Hey, don't you want to come on down? The water's fine." Uh, luckily, you know I'm not that dumb and. I like alligators, I just don't like alligators up close and personal, so. But the cast of Babylon 5 I thought was excellent. Uh, you know, people say, you know, anyone could be recast, but I honestly could not imagine anyone but Peter Jurassic in the role of Londo Malari, the Centauri ambassador. He embodied that in every scene he's in. He chews the scenery and he makes you think he is that manipulative man who will do anything to protect his his nation, his system, whatever it is. Andreas Katsoulis played Ambassador Jakar, same kind of thing. You know, he owned that role and I, you know, if they ever do reboot the, the show, you know, there was talk about that and I think that fell by the wayside when uh, the CW was talking about trying to get it together and then they got sold and well that's another drama filled story for another day but John Sheridan played by oh, what's his name? Bruce Boxleitner Bruce Boxleitner Clyde Christensen uh, or Clyde Christian whatever my apologies for getting your name wrong she plays Commander Susan Ivanova the executive officer of the station uh, Richard Biggs played 
Dr. Stephen Franklin, the chief medical officer of the station. And each one of these characters has growth throughout the series, and they all have their own different story arcs. Dr. Franklin, for example, is a workaholic. And like most, most uh, good intentions, you know, the, those roads of good intentions are paved with gold and lead straight to hell. He starts taking stims, you know. At that point, I think it was like some sort of a, a legal stimulant, but at a certain point, after you take enough of it, you become addicted to it and come to find out, sure enough, he, he did become addicted to it. Garibaldi, played by the late uh, Jerry Doyle, uh, confronts him on it and Stephen Franklin resigns as the chief medical officer and goes on walkabout trying to detox himself and effectively find himself. I'm sure we've all had that experience where we just want to <laughs> drop everything, go for a walk until we find ourselves and figure out what the hell we're going to do with our lives. Jerry Doyle was, you know, he passed several years ago, an alcoholic and that was one of his storylines where he had given up the bottle but after several stressful periods he had returned to it I've never experienced addiction like that but I've, I've seen what it can do and yeah that's pretty bad Claudia Christensen's character uh, Susan Ivanova is a latent telepath in, in the canon of Babylon 5 telepaths are not supposed to no matter how weak they are, are supposed to be able to serve an Earth Force. A, uh, a Psy Corps was developed where anyone with psi, psionic telepathic abilities is sent for training to help serve. And then if you don't want to serve, you can either go to prison or you take a drug to suppress your, your telepathic talents. Now, she hid this from everyone and, you know, as Clark was attempting to establish some loyalty tests with, you know, command staff, you know, what better way to do that than with a telepath who can actually go around and muddle around in your mind. She was going to resign until Sheridan, or was it Sinclair, I forget, whoever, whoever it was, it is, I'll be honest, it's been a while since I've seen the show, you know, basically comes up with a workaround to prevent that from happening. But after Babylon 5 breaks away, they become an independent station. But without the resources of Earth Force and EarthGov to help provide things like, you know, food, spare parts, replacement soldiers, technicians, that kind of thing, they have to make do with what they have and open up. All right, we got somebody up here, so I'm going to just turn around and start walking back. So they uh, basically become a free port and start hiring all these smugglers <laughs> that tried to run different things through Babylon 5. But instead of smuggling guns or drugs or whatever illegal commodities, trying to get, you know, replacement parts for the Star Furies or food, medicine, you know, whatever the case is. But if you haven't seen Babylon 5, I highly recommend that you check it out. Uh, I am not used to be on... HBO Max, HBO Now, whatever the hell they're calling it. I guess the contract ran out and it's, I think it's streaming on Tubi or something like that. I mean, you can obviously get the show through any of your streaming purchase places, you know, uh, Google Play. I'm pretty sure Amazon has it. But certainly give it a, a, a go or at least watch some, some of it on uh, YouTube. I'm sure it's there as well. Some of it does look dated, you know, you, you can't fight that because it was filmed in pan and scan. Well, actually, no, I guess technically it was, it was still filmed in 16 by 9, but it was cropped to fit on a normal television screen. And when you watch, you know, a show that was designed for, you know, regular definition on high def for a 4K television, you see where a lot of it, a lot of the sets look a lot more rickety. They don't look quite as polished as they did. On that small television but much like Doctor Who for me 
I'm not necessarily watching it for the visual effects. You know, those are can be a big part of it, and depending upon how good or how bad they are, they can pull you out. But at the same time, it's the story for me. It's the story that uh, keeps bringing me, excuse me, keeps bringing me back over and over again because I find the story exceptionally compelling. I like the fact that the characters are not one-dimensional. They're not all good. They're not all bad. I mean, there's a handful of characters that are truly, you know, reprehensible, no redeeming qualities. Emperor Kutaja comes to mind. But, you know, the characters, the main cast, the supporting cast, such, you know, like, uh, Bill Moomy of Lost in Space fame plays Lanier, the adjunct to Ambassador to the Land of the Mimbari Federation. And he is very much a follow the orders, but also thinks outside of the box when he needs to break a rule. The Mimbari are very honor driven, and it is bad form to the point of dishonoring one's clan to do some things, but he goes out of his way to figure out how to do it and hello hello but yeah give it a, give it a shot uh, the first season a lot of people don't like because they prefer John Sheridan over uh, Sinclair but at the same time you get the introduction to the cast you get the introduction to the conflict and there are some outstanding episodes in the first season, you know, I forget what the episode's called, but effectively, you know, kind of in the, the same vein as like the writer's strike. Uh, Babylon 5, is, you know, on top of being a military installation, also handles, you know, cargo coming in and coming out. And in order for cargo to move through the Babylon station, you do have to have dock workers. And like a lot of people, they might have to sign a shitty contract in order to get the job done. And, you know, the powers that be will take advantage of that contract as fully as they can. And all of a sudden, there's a massive accident. People are killed. And these dock workers are looking to strike to get a better better wage, better working conditions, you know, more help. You know, all, all of the stuff that, you know, modern people are, are screaming about as well. And, in big corporate fashion, the company that employs them sends out a, a strike-breaking knee thug. But he uh, thinks that he's got everything in hand. And he's going to invoke what is called the Rush Act. And the Rush Act is basically, I, from what I've read, it's based off of Rush Limbaugh. You know, one of the, oh, I'm not going to get into the politics of it. But at any rate, the Rush Act basically gives whoever the military commander is of that station the ability to break up the strike at however they see fit. Now the assumption is Sinclair is going to basically send in security, arrest everyone, and put them back to work or start bringing on new, uh, new dock workers and basically shit can all the old ones and you know basically hire a bunch of scabs, if you will. And that's, that's the assumption, that's what the, uh, the strike breaker wanted, basically to send a message, don't stand up to EarthGov, you're going to get squashed. So, Sinclair, looking at the documentation of the law, the Rush Act, figures out a solution that makes the dock workers happy, prevents more violence, and basically throws the, uh, the, uh, the strike breaker under the bus. And, spoiler alert, what uh, Sheridan does, excuse me, what Sinclair does is he takes a portion of the Babylon 5 military budget that is put aside for like readiness and other things and reallocates it to the docking bays so that they can hire more workers, so that they can get equipment replaced and all of that. And while, yeah, it's a political victory for, or a political defeat for EarthGov, Sinclair does make some, some, en <clears throat> make some enemies. And as he points it, as he points out, 
don't hand somebody a gun unless you know, you know where they're going to point it. Babylon 5 does have some of my favorite sayings as well. One of the ones that I, I really enjoy. Uh, Kosh says this uh, before he's killed. Uh, the avalanche has already started. It is too late for the pebble to vote. Now, I believe somebody else said that, and that was adapted for the show. Whoever wrote it, you know, leave, leave me in the comment. Leave me a comment below if you know who that was. And basically, <laughs> once something big enough has started, it doesn't matter who who's against it. It's not going to it's not going to stop it. And that's with uh, the wars. But Akash is one of the more interesting and often the more infuriating characters because he's aloof from everyone. He pretty much just watches and observes. He will often give a one word or small sentence answers and just kind of wander off. Ambassador Dakar is probably another one of my favorite characters. No, he's definitely one of my favorite characters. And he, like Londo, has some of the best character growth. So, Londo Malari character growth. He starts off as an old, washed-up ambassador whose sole job is to not give away the Empire because nobody wants to represent the Centauri Republic on this doomed space station. An embarrassment... Eh, I might stop talking. He's an embarrassment, effectively. And nobody wants a job. After he hooks up with Mr. Morden... Mr. Morden! His star goes into ascension again, and he becomes, you know, very important and very popular with the people back home. He eventually rises in the ranks, but he also realizes that as he becomes more popular, he becomes a threat politically to the establishment, and they start putting more, rain, uh, more uh, ropes around him to keep him in check, because the last thing they want is somebody like... Malari to turn the sword that he's been given that has helped the Republic regain some of its stature and potentially, you know, carve himself a niche or, you know, become the next Emperor, which ultimately he does. He does become, but that's later on. And somebody even comments that Lundo's holding on to a wild horse because he doesn't know what to do otherwise. He's terrified, but he knows if he lets go, that's it. And ultimately, you know, Lando is a patriot. He wants to serve his, his nation. He wants to serve his people, and he does it the best way that he can, but, you know, let's face it, he's a tragic figure in the, the greatest Greek sense. All right, I'm gonna stop talking. I'll figure out how to fast forward this until I get to the other side. Babylon of a Babylon 5. Going to the end. I'm gonna start the one mile trek back to the hotel. <clears throat> so, let's move a little away from the road here because there's still quite a bit of traffic. All right. All right, so, Ambassador Jakar, the Narn ambassador to Babylon 5, unlike Ambassador Malari, he wants to be there because he wants to flex the, the uh, Narn muscles and start clawing their, their planet into a point of ascension. He's antagonistic towards Malari and the Centauri for obvious reasons, and ultimately he wants absolute revenge, at least initially, against the Centauri, working to undermine them at every sense. In the first episode of the first season, the mighty Narn war machine attack a planet that the Centauri had taken from them, and he feigns complete ignorance until it's revealed, you know, they finally find out who actually attacks. 
and Jakar at first, and to a later extent is still throughout the series, is a very cunning, very manipulative, and a very charismatic person. But after the Centauri defeat the Narn in their war, he's cast out as the ambassador. And he kind of takes over the resistance, you know, as the, the Centauri start to occupy Narn, the Narn start their next resistance. Now, here's the deal. This, since the Centauri had gone through this before, they've changed things up. When they go to invade Narn, as opposed to sending a bunch of, you know, boots on the ground trying to subjugate everything, uh, they basically bomb Narn back into the Stone Age with mass drivers, these giant cannons that effectively, as opposed to shooting some sort of an energy weapon, create something with a ton of mass and effectively bombard the planet, destroying everything. And as they say on the show, bomb them back to the Stone Age and, you know, the particulate matter that was knocked kilometers into the sky will take years to finally settle down. After Narn is finally subjugated and or surrenders, they put out you know several several very strict edicts that every member of the Kari, the which is the ruling body, must surrender. Anyone who any Centauri that is killed by a Narn, that Narn's family, and like 500 more are going to be killed. Kind of incentive to you know not do it. Something so drastic that uh, it will dissuade anyone and you know basically they're just you know kind of dicks about it naturally the uh, the Narns do fight back just more cleverly looking for resources everywhere that they can and yeah Jakar goes from being this you know ambitious diplomat to being a, uh, a, a true leader, and he has something of a spiritual awakening, if you will. Kosh gets into his mind and kind of, I won't say pokes around, but shows him a few things that he might have forgotten, and Jakar realizes that you have to fight a different kind of war to free his people, and... He still can be ruthless, but he, he does take control of, of the people that are free and uses them more wisely. And ultimately, when uh, Babylon 5 breaks away, one of the biggest resources that they had would have been manpower. So many people, you know, aren't going to want to go against their government. You know, they want to, you know, be loyal or whatever. So the Narn that are on the station step in and become uh, the de facto security force, which, you know, aggravates the uh, Centauri to no end, but, you know, they do keep the peace. So there's that. So Babylon 5 started life on a failed station. I think it was called, let's see, uh, not UPN. It was the precursor to UPN, the PTN, Primetime Network. And it was, you know, they were trying to get it started. It got renewed through the fourth season, but there was no guarantee there would be a fifth season because there was no guarantee that there would be a station to continue to broadcast. So JMS kind of condensed what he was going to do with the fourth and fifth seasons into the fourth season, which is why you've got normal pacing on seasons one through three. You know, there are some some great character develop developments. There's some humor in there. There's some, you know, quote-unquote slow episodes. You know, I won't call them filler, but they're not, not all action-filled. Come fourth season, the action is ramped up because you've got to deal with the Shadow and Vorlon Wars. You've got to deal with the conflict on the Narn homeworld, you know, the freeing of the Narn. And then you still have needing to for the, uh, the humans, the Terrans, the whatevers, to go back to Earth and take, you know, EarthGov away from President Clark. And, you know, that's kind of a tall order. Three big, three very big arcs over, you know, a 22, 24 episode season, whatever the case is. 
and pretty much from the first episode of season four until the final episode it, it the action is pretty much not stop you know constant conflict a lot of battles and the great thing about Babylon 5 again is it's very story driven the problem being if you miss an episode you know this is before the time of DVR and unless you had a VCR and set it up to record you'd have to wait till it rolls around again that happened to me uh, you know they were building up for towards the invasion of Earth Ivanova was in charge of the uh, freedom the the fleet of light or whatever they called it you know basically the good guy fleet I missed the next episode and she's dead well no she's not dead but she's in med bay with Marcus you know dead and I'm like what the hell did I miss here and it took me several years before I actually got to see the episode you know actually filled in the blanks so you know where's you take an episode of the next generation or the original series of Star Trek you can flop around between any one of the seasons and unless you happen to pick you know the second part of a two-parter they're self-contained stories you know you don't have that luxury in Babylon 5 which is a great boon for the long-form storytelling but it kind of makes it harder for the casual viewer to watch and know what's going on so TNT picked up Babylon 5 season 5 and you know there's a distinctive change in tone JMS had written the vast majority of like season 2 through season 4 if not all of them but he actually had a regular writing staff and a lot of fans find season 5 to be the weakest of it and often they will say there are only four seasons you know har 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 but you know the biggest complaint is the uh the telepaths that show up on season five, basically. Sure, you have the Psychor, that where all telepaths are supposed to go be trained, be indoctrinated, become good little telepaths following orders, you know, the core's mother, the core's father. But then there are also telepaths that don't want to do that, but they also don't want to go to jail and they don't want to take the drugs, so they set up a uh, their own small groups, their own cells, trying to smuggle telepaths out. And that was a story arc early on in Babylon 5, the Telepath Railroad, where anyone that didn't want to actually join the Psychor, you know, was basically smuggled out, you know, Harriet Tubman style. Well, come to find out, the shadows are susceptible to telepaths. So one of the ways that they figure out how to combat that is to use telepaths as the brains of their shadow vessels. So telepaths that are usually sent off to like the telepath prison are smuggled out or transferred, I guess, because they can legally do it, to these shadow vessels where they're implanted with shadow tech so they can be plugged into a shadow vessel and fight telepaths, you know, any telepath that might try to attack the ship because the shadows use organic technology. They're not, you know, your regular ships like the Earth Force has. At any rate, these telepaths, after Clark's overthrown and there's some semblance of normalcy returning to Earth, they want to set up their own colony. So they show up on Babylon 5 and you know, demand asylum. Well, request asylum. You know, demand is kind of a strong word. You know, trying to find a planet for themselves. Unfortunately, they're... Uh, well, things happen, and as is the case in television, tragedy happens. And the character Byron, he's the leader of the telepaths. A lot of the fans just didn't like him. I don't mind him. He's not, you know, the best character, but he's not the worst character. He's not the season killer that so many in the Babylon 5 fandom seem to make him out to be. But after season 5... They were going to try a continuation story, uh, a new series called Crusade. And there was a telemovie, I forget what it was called, but effectively agents of the shadows who were upset that the shadows left them decide that they're going to start wreaking havoc. It might have been the Drok. The Drok being, you know, uh, uh, an evil faction. 
infects Earth with a plague, and you know it would take you know like five or seven years or something like that for the plague to finally adapt and annihilate all life on the planet. So Earth effectively becomes quarantine. Nobody gets in. Nobody gets out. And Crusade was about at least the first season was supposed to be about the ship Excalibur going, you know, doing Star Trekky things, looking, going planet to planet, looking for a cure for the Drock Plague. Now my understanding is season one was going to be just that, them looking for the plague, uh, a cure for the plague, and then, you know, obviously the plague gets cured and, you know, everything goes back to normal. And then you start having, you know, normal traveling around the galaxy, planet to planet adventures. But apparently TNT didn't have much faith in the project and pretty much had it canceled before the first episode even aired. And then they, they did their best to screw things up by airing things out of order. You know, if you watch the quote unquote first episode, you know, I think the costumes are different. And TNT just did everything that they could to ensure that uh, it wouldn't survive and there would nobody care. I really liked Crusade. The little bit that I saw, mostly because it, to an extent it was new. Sure, it was set on an Earth Force ship, but it had an interesting cast. And about, you know, episode four, episode five, that's when the writers and the cast really started to gel. And it's usually about, you know, three or five episodes into any series before you really get a feel for the, the writers get a feel for the characters, the, char the actors get a feel for the characters, and everything starts coming together. But it got canned. They tried, they did put out several telemovies. The last of which was Legend of the Rangers. And that's another one that, that is often derided by the fans. And the only thing that I really didn't, oh wow, that is a big ass bird. No idea if I got it. We'll see. Uh, you know, the... The weapon system of the, the ranger ship I didn't like, but I did like the cast and I thought it was really well put together. You know, it's a shame that it didn't uh, get picked up, you know. They did uh, a couple of small straight-to-video movies, but you could de definitely tell they weren't on real sets. It was all blue screen. And, you know, I forget what they're called. They weren't bad, but there was a lot of promise, but they didn't generate enough interest. Now, recently they put out a, uh, a movie, an uh, animated movie, I think it's called uh, Babylon 5, The Road Home. And obviously they had to recast some of the characters because, you know, Stephen Biggs, Mira Furling, uh have passed along with Andreas Katsoulis. So, kind of hard to bring them in, so they got different cast members. I haven't seen it yet. I've I've read some really good reviews. I've also read some really bad reviews. I guess it just depends upon you know whether you like stories continued animated form. I'm sure I'll see it at some point, just not anytime soon. But yeah, Babylon 5 has some absolutely amazing episodes. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I totally recommend it, especially if you're a sci-fi fan. Uh, it does take a little while to get used to. Season one is hit and miss in a lot of aspects because, again, you know, they're getting used to the characters, getting rest, ready for the story and all of that. But I don't skip season one. I'm sure that you can find, like, order watch episodes, episodes that you can watch and episodes that you can skip. But every episode has something that contributes to the overall story even if it's something small. And there are some great, great payoffs later on in the show. And, you know, my favorite, and one of my favorites, I should say, and if you haven't seen it, you won't get it, but if you know, you know. But give Babylon 5 a, a, a go. Let me know what you think, because it is one of my favorite shows. I like the the moral ambiguity that a lot of the characters have because you know <laughs> characters do things that are morally reprehensible but they know that they have to be done in order to win 
and it's I just find it very well written so I highly recommend it if you've seen Babylon 5 what do you think if you don't like Babylon 5 let me know down in the comments why you don't like it try to keep it as polite as possible this is uh, a conversation I'm not looking to be attacked for being a Babylon 5 fan if you've seen the road home what did you think of it do you recommend it Go ahead and like and subscribe. Leave me some comments below. And we'll catch you the next time.